Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In uh, this combined uh, lecture 23rd and 24th, we continue our discussion on solving elliptic equation once again. And uh, we try to uh, go back historically to the Jacobi method and point out that um, some of these point iterative methods are more amenable to parallel computing. And uh, uh, having identified that, we also uh, discuss about uh, the convergence properties of uh, these methods, which relates to diagonal dominance property of this associated A matrix, uh, which in turn determines the spectral radius of this diagonal dominant matrix. Um, in this context, uh, we are going to talk about a theorem, which is attributed to Stein and Rosenberg. Uh, we will pick up some model uh, problems and explain the Stein and Rosenberg theorem. Uh, we notice that uh, there are other possibilities of accelerating the convergence, namely by relaxation methods. These are built upon around those basic uh, methods that we already talked about. So, in this relaxation methods, which are also known as successive over relaxation methods, we are going to talk about an SOR method or successive over relaxation method on the gauss idle uh, basic methods. Uh, we find out that there are ranges of uh, this relaxation parameters that is given by this Ostrowski Varga theorem, which says that this parameter has to be between 0 and 2. And once we have uh, figured out how to uh, accelerate the convergence, we try to quantify this convergence criteria or the performance parameter of iterative methods. That is what we are going to talk about. And uh, in this context, we see that some of this line iterative methods could be further improved and a new method was uh, enunciated in 1950s, which is called the alternative direction implicit method or ADI method. This is how we are going to switch over from classical method to a method which is found to be quite uh, efficient. Uh, you would find that Jacobi method uh, uh, I mean, is still used for uh, solving some of this uh, classes of problem because you don't really need to um, pass on the information as the iteration progresses from the neighboring nodes. You know, one of the major problem in parallel computing is uh, I/O input I/O output processes. I/O processes actually. Uh, reduces the speed and sometimes it can lead to what is called as a latency problem. So, maybe one node is done, but it is waiting for the neighboring nodes to complete that sequence of work and pass that information, then only you can proceed. So, some nodes will be active, some will be inactive. This is a problem of latency that comes about and that is not visited upon uh, when you are actually using Jacobi method. So, please do understand that it is not a historic discourse. I mean, we still have utility for uh, methods uh, like Jacobi method. <coughs> so, for Jacobi iteration for this equation A x equal to B, we split the A into three parts and uh, this is not same like what we talked about in uh, that particular example of uh, A 1, A 2, A 3 matrix that we have talked about. Here, it is a much more a, of a general problem. So, this A matrix is uh, split into a strictly lower triangular matrix that we identify as L. Then we have a uh, D matrix, which is the diagonal matrix and U is the strictly upper triangular matrix. So, when I write L and U on the diagonal, there are no uh, non-zero entries. Those uh, non-zero entries are strictly put into the D matrix itself, right? <coughs> now, we also know for the Jacobi iteration, uh, we do that iteration where we take that new matrix, which replaces the original A matrix is 
uh, given by the diagonal matrix itself. So, n is equal to d and uh, we have seen uh, that g is given by i minus n inverse a. So, n is d. So, this is d inverse a. The i itself I could write it like uh, d inverse into d. Right? If I do that, uh, then I can factor out a uh, uh, d inverse and I get this. What is a minus d? a minus d is nothing but uh, L plus u. So, we have an expression uh, for G matrix which uh, looks rather clean as given in the last uh, equation 45. All you need to know the diagonal uh, split matrix and the sum of uh, lower and upper uh, triangular matrix. And uh, this we have already stated uh, that error uh, goes by uh, multiplication of the G matrix and what we can say that E of k would be written in terms of G into E of k minus 1. Now, what we can do in uh, writing out in component form, what we actually do is basically we write it like uh, alpha i i into E i and uh, everything else other than the diagonal entry is put on the right hand side and that is what you have it in this uh, square bracket in 47. So, starting from E 1 uh, to E n, they are at the previous level and multiplied by the entries of that A matrix at A or G or whatever you say. That is how you get it, right. So, this is how we get. <coughs> now, uh, what you notice that uh, we can define a parameter which I call as theta i, which is nothing but uh, these uh, quantities that are inside the coefficients alpha i j and uh, everything is divided by the diagonal entry. So, that I write it as alpha i i. So, what happens is what we are seeing that the error at the ith point uh, at the kth iterate depends on the product of these theta i times the error at the previous step. So, what does this uh, parameter indicate? The parameter actually tells you uh, how each of these quantities, uh, different points, different errors are contributing to the error at this kth level, right. So, if I have this quantity uh, very small, that quantity, uh, that particular component of uh, E at the previous level does not contribute, while if this point is very close to 1 or more than 1, then I can see that uh, that quantity actually gives more contribution. So, what happens is this ratio theta i basically tells you the role of the coefficient vis a vis the corresponding diagonal component, right. That is what it is. So, what happens is given a matrix A, then you should start looking for uh, what is this ratio going to be. If this ratio is uh, less than 1, that means what? It will contribute lesser and lesser at the subsequent level. That is what it means. So, this property is called the property of diagonal dominance, right. So, I could uh, basically uh, define a max based on maximum principle a some kind of a error norm which I have called here at E of k. That is the maximum when I scan through all the uh, entries of that E k vector and then uh, we have this uh, triangular inequality, right. So, I could uh, write that uh, the modulus of error at the kth point is less than that quantity that we defined as theta i. So, in 48 you can see this theta i is uh, here and that basically tells you that uh, I could say that error at the kth level is bounded by error at the previous level times the maximum value of theta, right. So, this, this makes it a stronger case. So, if I scan through all theta and pick up the maximum, then this inequality will be even stronger when I replace this theta i's uh, by theta max, right. So, that is what we have done. So, what happens is then we can see the convergence will be faster, the error will decay faster if I have this theta max itself is as small as possible. So, this is uh, what we really want. 
This is what we really want, that as we keep on going through this exercise of iteration, we want the successive error norm should keep coming down. And that will be ensured if this theta max is less than 1. So, if theta max is less than 1, then we can see this Jacobi iteration will uh, converge. And this is what is called as the property of diagonal dominance. That means what? The diagonal entry dominates over all the off diagonal terms. Uh, then, of course, all the theta i's will be less than 1 and uh, the maximum value is also less than 1. So, theta max is less than 1. So, this is uh, what is called as a diagonal dominance uh, condition uh, for convergence of Jacobi iteration and this is uh, uh, shown to be sufficient and it has been also shown as a sufficient condition for gauss seidel iteration. However, I will come back to you and uh, show you some simple examples where I will uh, investigate that in some cases Jacobi iteration converges, gauss seidel does not and vice versa. Okay. So, basically um, what does this diagonal dominance mean is uh, that is also something similar to what we have already said. Uh, theta max uh, would be somewhat related to the spectral radius of the G matrix. We have seen right in the beginning of today that uh, the spectral radius, the maximum eigenvalue determines uh, the convergence rate. And if uh, spectral radius is less than 1 and you have a or alternatively you have a matrix uh, which is diagonally dominant, then uh, both of them actually imply convergence. Okay. <coughs> there has uh, been some attempt in uh, formalizing some of these results and this has been stated by one of the theorem that is due to Stein and Rosenberg. And which states the following conditions that if I have a, a matrix with the following property, uh, the properties are written like this that the diagonal quantities are let us say positive and off diagonal quantities are negative and in addition what we have is the magnitude of the diagonal is uh, uh, greater than the sum of the magnitude of all off diagonal terms. So, theta was measuring individual entities, but this theorem uh, demands something more stronger. It says you take the off diagonal entries, obtain its uh, magnitude, sum it over, accepting of course, the diagonal part and if this inequality is uh, given, then it is strictly diagonally dominant. right? So, the diagonal uh, is really overpowering everything. Now, it, it may seem uh, uh, too much of a thing to ask, I mean how often would you get to that kind of a scenario. So, let us take a look at uh, what we actually do. If you recall that the A matrix that we had uh, written for the Laplacian, uh, sorry, <coughs> what we found that this A matrix had minus 4, along the diagonal, then we had uh, plus 1, sub diagonal, super diagonal we had 1. I am just talking about a simple case of uh, uh, where delta x equal to delta y kind of a problem and that is this. So, now if you look at uh, many problems of computing, you come across the Laplacian operator right? and this is the corresponding expression for the A matrix for the Laplacian. And you can see I could uh, just take a minus sign whole through. So, then I could get the diagonals as all positive and all diagonal terms as all negative. right? So, in this case what happens uh, if I look at it uh, say some line here, uh, well I have drawn it in such a way that I do not have all the 5 quantities together, but if I look at it what I see that uh, the diagonal term in, in those cases where I have all the 5 entities uh, becomes equal to see this uh, sign here, there would be equal to sign that is what is uh, 
35. 4 is sum of all those off diagonal terms. So, this is uh, quite often obtained. In addition, if you look at uh, some of the top lines or the bottom lines, where you can actually find that this is missing. So, of course, this is a strictly diagonally dominant row, all right, in the first line. The same way the last row, you can see it is strictly diagonally dominant because this has uh, become 4 and this has become 2, right. So, this kind of condition as uh, demanded in this Stein Rosenberg theorem is uh, quite often met. So, the statement that strict inequality for some i is required, it is very often made. And uh, the last condition, 3, is irreducible. I, I suppose you can recall uh, your uh, earlier exposure on linear algebra. Uh, what is irreducible matrix? Well, it's, uh, it is that, uh, that the rank of the matrix is equal to the size of the matrix, right? That means what? You do not have any redundant equations. All the equations are linearly independent. So, in most of the physical problem, that's how it should be. So, that's not a very strict condition to uh, demand from. Now, uh, if we have a matrix A with these uh, three properties, and we can estimate uh, the gain matrix for the Jacobi iteration Gj and the Gauss Idle matrix that I call it as Gs, then uh, we could uh, have uh, the following mutually exclusive relationship uh, holding. The first condition which says that uh, maybe the all the eigenvalues of uh, uh, Jacobi and Gauss Idle iterations are equal to 0. Either that is true or both the methods are convergent, right? So, all the eigenvalues are less than 1, right? However, if you look at uh, the sequence that when both the methods are convergent, the Gauss idle is more convergent, right? Because uh, Jacobi lambdas are greater than lambdas for Gauss idle, okay? So, when both the methods converge, the Gauss idle method seems to perform better. And that should be our expectation. That is what I told you in the beginning that when I use more concurrent information, I should expect some improvement. But then, provided that A matrix should have all those three properties that we saw in the previous slide. The second last case is that both the methods are neutrally convergent, means they do not reduce error, it just simply keeps on retaining it unchanged. In fact, uh, in many of the practical computations, you will see that is what is happening. That after a few iterations, you see it does not change at all. It just remains like this. And uh, the last condition says, both the methods could be divergent. Uh, and if they are divergent, you will find the gauss idle method is more divergent than the Jacobi method. Okay? It is a simple model problem. So, we are looking at a, a simple model problem. So, you should not have to uh, uh, really worry about you could just simply invert the matrix and get the solution directly. But let us uh, uh, consider this uh, via the uh, Jacobi and uh, Gauss idle iteration. How do we uh, solve it? Okay? So, basically, uh, what we are going to do is uh, if I am doing a Jacobi iteration, what I would do, right? So, if I do this, uh, what do I get? Uh, let me start uh, with some initial guess. And the easiest thing for me to do would be to take uh, all of them equal to 0, right? Then uh, what I am going to get from here the next uh, iterate k equal to 1, uh, what I would get x 1 would be equal to 1, x 2 would be equal to 3 and x 3 would be equal to 5. So, these are basically we are these are the initial and from the initial guesses we are obtaining this, right? Okay. Now, uh, the next step, what would I get? So, you just uh, substitute uh, this value of 
x 2 and x 3 what I what I am going to get here. This will be 1 plus 10 minus 6. So, that will be Right. The second equation would be equal to minus 3 and third equation would give us also equal to minus 3. Right. And uh, you look at uh, k equal to 3. Uh, what we are going to get is what, uh, this two will cancel out. So, I will get x 1 of 3 equal to 1 and from the second equation I will get uh, 3 minus 1 and plus 3. So, this will also be minus of minus And this also will become R. Of course, there is uh, no prize for guessing that is the solution. You can see that uh, all the equations are satisfied when I take this. So, what it actually means that uh, if you keep doing it further on, they will all uh, be the same value, right. So, what it shows that uh, for this model problem, um, the Jacobi method actually converged in uh, three steps, three steps, right. It, it, it did work that way. Now, uh, if I uh, move over and uh, try to set up an equivalent. Uh, Goss Seidel method. So, what I would uh, be doing, uh, I would take let us say the first equation to evaluate uh, x 1. So, if I call this as the case iterate for x 1, then I will probably have an identical step that what we had done for the Jacobi method. However, what will happen is uh, when I come to evaluating x 2, because it is a point a Gauss cycle, if I already have something available, I will use that current information. So, the x 1 being evaluated here, I will put it like this, right. And uh, of course, x 2, uh, did I write something wrong? None of you pointed out. So, this will be x 3 uh, k minus 1, okay. And uh, look at the third step, uh, that would uh, give us what? 5 minus 2 x 1, this is available at the current level. So, I could uh, basically so, from here I will use this uh, information, whatever x 1 is uh, made available via the current level of computation, we will use that, right. So, the same way the x 2 is evaluated, so I will use it here. That is uh, probably uh, one of the way, you can set it up in various other possible ways. I could take to a uh, struggling and then uh, what I would find that uh, k equal to 0, uh, we start off with uh, again the same thing like before, okay. Uh, you can keep doing and uh, you will find that uh, this uh, does not show any sign of uh, convergence. So, we draw the conclusion. So, what happened is that even for such a simple system for a 3 by 3 system, I have uh, got 
is from one of the paper by Scholar. Put this thing up uh, to show that your Jacobi method converges, the gauss seidel method diverges. So, where did we lose the game? How, how, how did this happen? Was the previous theorem of any use? We just uh, enunciated uh, the Stein-Rosenberg theorem. What do we get? Look at uh, the property of the matrix. Satisfied. Uh, the, this one is of course satisfied. It's irreducible. Uh, you actually lose out on the second condition in a very, very big way. The diagonal down. I mean, right? The way we have written it down. This, these are the diagonal elements, and you can see the off-diagonal terms, their magnitude dominates over the diagonal entry. So, you do not have the diagonal dominance. So, of course, this theorem does not work. Our initial condition, the starting requirement of the property of A matrix are not satisfied. So, that is what we are not going to make use of the Stein-Rosenberg theorem. And we have to uh, uh, be uh, aware of the fact. That's what I said. That uh, apart from the property A, even this one we'll have to check if A is a symmetric positive definite or not. How do you do that? If you remember how to check for that, what you do is you take that A matrix and you work out the various sub matrices that you can from that. Right? You can get this. 3 by 3, 2 by 2, 1 by 1 matrices. And then uh, uh, when you take the determinant of those matrices, they all have to be strictly as a three circuit positive. That is when you call them as uh, positive definite. And symmetry is, of course, you can um, this is uh, not at all symmetric. Of course, of course, symmetry is also violated, diagonal dominance is violated. That is what we do not get it. Okay. Uh, Done that, uh, we focus our attention to other things, other uh, ways and means by which we can uh, get the method work for us. And one of the ways that we can make uh, even this uh, iterative method work for us is uh, by this is relaxation method. If you recall um, that we started off uh, this uh, iterative method by solving this alternative equation. Remember, we changed A to a new matrix N and then we worked upon the solution uh, increment over iteration and on the right hand side that is pushed by the residue. Okay? So, basically residue is uh, like your forces, right? The residue forces uh, the variation in U L plus 1 from U L to U L plus 1 that is driven by this quantity r, right. So, this was uh, observed and we uh, figured out that the spectral radius was given by i minus n inverse a, remember? That is what we got <coughs> if we uh, adopt equation 13. However, we could uh, try to do something different. Uh, that is uh, that we do not take the residue at each and every point as we have calculated. We actually over, I mean give it overestimated uh, uh, role or underestimated role. So, that what we uh, do is uh, we take the residue and multiply by parameter theta and that is what is called as the relaxation parameter. If uh, uh, less than 1, then of course, we are under relaxing. So, whatever the residue we have, we are taking a smaller component and forcing it uh, to convergence, trying to converge or if we take uh, theta between uh, 1 and 2, uh, then uh, we have what we call as over elastication method. Uh, however, in the literature of both this uh, type of uh, variants are called successive over relaxation method or uh, what we call as the SOR. 
successive over elastic independence. Okay. <clears throat> now, why we choose uh, the limit for theta to be between one and two for the over relaxation method is uh, governed by a theorem uh, due to Varga and Ostrowski, which we'll uh, state uh, later. But I can just resist uh, telling you the story that when Professor uh, Southwell used to do this kind of work in Cambridge uh, more than a hundred years ago, then uh, he used to actually use uh, human operators to do this sort of calculation. So in a room, I may have narrated this story to you before, that you would make this uh, human operator uh, to represent the node in a grid. And then you go through this kind of exercise just now what I did. Remember in the gauss seidel method, I said, okay, first equation I used to calculate x1. And that information is required the person who calculates x2, because that is what was due to that uh, uh, operator, because you have to take the most current value, whatever is available. So what would happen, all these people would uh, keep doing this, and Professor Southwell noted that uh, if you actually say, okay, that is where the residue is maximum, and in this corner residue is minimum, so I would try to change, give more uh, weightage here and less weightage there, try to uh, sort of equalize the march towards convergence by changing this. So basically, what uh, even talking about this theta that we have given, capital theta, would be position dependent. Someone will take uh, more weighted, someone will take less weighted. And this used to go on. Uh, that is how this method was uh, really, uh, worked out, but when you actually approach a computer, you do not do such a thing. You try to keep theta same for all the points, otherwise it becomes uh, mind-bogglingly difficult, because you have to work out some kind of a strategy algorithm, how you relate this theta with uh, node location. So basically, uh, part is ad abandoned, and this is what uh, uh, is uh, currently practiced. Well, uh, about the story, about the story of the, it had a tragic uh, ending of the story because uh, Professor Southwell was a very, very, uh, uh, I would say, stern taskmaster. So he used to uh, take away the salary for every mistake that someone makes. So what would happen in the room? Everybody would compute. And every set of iteration would be over, then he would oversee and he would say, okay, now we can go to the next iteration. So that is how he used to do it. And in the process, he would find that some operator would have made some mistakes. And of course, that uh, destroys the whole flow of calculation. And so he used to dock salary. He used to take money away for making wrong calculations. And it is saved. I am not so sure. It is just a story that some of them would. Uh, went back with the deficit at the end of the day. So uh, that is the sad part. But anyway, uh, this is an example that how the subject is where what computer does today once upon a time, uh, unfortunate human being used to do all that. And uh, of course, uh, what we can do is uh, really, really uh, fantastic compared to those days. Okay. <clears throat> now, suppose. Uh, we uh, adopt that uh, algorithm that we said that n matrix uh, uh, working on uh, the solution residue. And here I have put uh, theta, uh, and this is the uh, um, RL, right? So if I uh, look at it, uh, I could uh, uh, work it out. Uh, how did you define R? I forgot. Tell me, how did we do that? H minus B or B minus A? Does anyone remember? Huh? I don't know. I'm. Uh, Right. 
this is how I do it. I can plug this in here and I can simplify. And what I find that uh, I get uh, this mu iterate u l plus 1 would be now i minus theta times n inverse h. Remember when uh, we did not adopt uh, relaxation method, theta was 1, right? So, then we add the uh, G matrix I minus uh, N inverse H. So, here what has happened uh, by adding this degree of freedom by introducing capital theta, we have uh, altered the gain matrix now, which is now a function of theta, okay? So, now what we notice that the gain matrix is given by I minus T inverse H, okay? So, uh, this is uh, the way we would like to do a theoretical framework, obtain the G matrix like this. Operationally, what we do is, uh, that is given in uh, equation 54. What you do is, you have an algorithm. With the algorithm, you calculate u bar at L plus 1. That is why that over bar uh, tells you that uh, you have worked it out here. Yeah. So, u bar L plus 1 is. You surprise me. Okay. Uh, what we uh, notice that uh, this is uh, the way uh, we would adopt. We have an older iterate UL. We have just now calculated u bar. L plus 1, and then we look at uh, what the solution has changed. We multiply by capital theta with that, and we add it to the prior quantity. It's like uh, what is called a character strategy in a predictor character approach. Uh, so, any uh, solution method is broken down into two steps. Okay, so you have a predictor method. You predict it the way any algorithm that you choose. Let's say it could be Jacobi, it could be Gauss Idle. You do that, and then you obtain that. So this u over bar l plus one is the output of the predictor stage, right? So now what you are doing, you are overlaying a additional correction, and that correction is uh, obtained from this equation 54. So equation 54 is the your character stage and this is your chosen algorithm. So, it is uh, basically the method that you may like to adopt, you will do that. Now, I have uh, tried to show it to you uh, if I adopt such a method uh, along with gauss idle point relaxation method and uh, I may say upfront I have a feeling that uh, some of these equations need uh, modification. So, please uh, bear with me. Uh, I may actually put up the correct uh, slides uh, in a day or two. <coughs> However, what you uh, notice that suppose we are doing a gauss idle method, our approach has been like this, that uh, if I am solving uh, the problem in a domain like this, I uh, arrived at a point here, that may mean that uh, the information available. This is what I have is uh, I will call that as u bar level. So, that level at the kth iterate here, whereas on this side, I would continue to use the previous iterate. That is your gauss idle uh, strategy, right? So, if I do that, I tried to write that down and I have a feeling that this equation may not be correct, this 55. I will have to take a look and uh, mount the correct one for you. Um, so, that is you have a two dimensional array, right? These are two dimensional, but you have stacked it up as a one dimensional array. That is what we do all the time. So, when I write u uh, vector here, Basically, it's a two-dimensional array written like a one-dimensional form, right? So that's what uh, we do. 
So, if I have, I have now come to the ith node, so the predictor stage what I am doing when I have come to the ith node, I will, I think that there is a gij missing here, please uh, bear with me. There is a gij which is multiplying the u's which are already been calculated. So, uh, so that, so that is what we, 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 we are doing. has been taken to the left hand side and anything below that i, I write it like this and anything that is above i, I write it in the second part, okay. Now, so that is the way I calculate, I predict an update for all the points, right. That is what we are doing and in doing so, we are actually uh, adopting those values which are currently available. Uh, in this first set of term, whereas the second set of term belongs to this part of the domain, right. So, <coughs> uh, following that predictor stage, we adopt the corrector stage. What we do is we do some simple uh, weighting. What do we do? Whatever we have predicted, we multiply quantity by theta, okay. So, this is this part. So, this part is nothing but the equation 55 itself. So, take 1 minus theta times the previous accepted solution. So, at the end of predictor and corrector stage, whatever I have, I call that the quantity without any uh, over bar. So, this is the previous iterate, okay. So, that I give 1 minus theta weightage and theta weightage to the currently calculated. And of course, uh, you can uh, write it down, what I have written in a algebraic equation form in 56, you can write it down in a matrix form, right. For example, u i k, what is u i k? u i k would be simply nothing but an identity matrix operating on the u vector, so that you just are picking the diagonal edge, that is what you are doing. And of course, 1 minus theta is a scalar quantity and u i k minus 1, I have just written it like this and theta times this operation, this operation now we will understand what we have done. If you, if you recall what we have done, we have taken uh, this quantity times, remember that is what we did, alpha i i into u i and this we kept it on the left hand side and on the right hand side, what I do is uh, I write alpha i j u j and this is going to be j equal to 1 to n and of course, I will exclude j equal to i point, right. That is what we do. So, this comes from where? This gives you something like your d matrix, diagonal entry. If I split that a into d, l and u, then this quantity gives you alpha i i gives you the d matrix, right. And this path what we have done, we have split it into two parts. We have written it down like this, alpha i j and u j. Now, j, I will uh, go from j equal to say 1 to i minus 1. That is one path which are known and then that would be at the current level. So, that is what we are doing, okay. Here, I did not write it because I, am, uh, I decided to right here for you uh, in a detailed way. And then in the second path, I will start from the right of the point in question. So, if i is the point in question, it will start from i plus 1 and this will take you all the way up to here. And this path is uh, also done like this, but this path is not known at the current level. So, that is what we do. So, you can see uh, uh, that uh, this part, what is this part? If I write it, uh, write A matrix as L plus D plus U, where would this come from? If, if you remember, if you take a look at this, this part comes in the lower part, lower triangular part of the matrix, right? Diagonal defines where I am. Anything below is the lower triangular part. Anything to the right? and above 
belongs to the upper triangular path. So that's what we have done. So this path is done something like D uh, matrix multiplying with U. So that is that. And this part, I will write it as L matrix operating on U. So I will write it as U of K and there also. Let me write it this. And this part would be right. So basically, that's how we have done. So D times U K is equal to L of U K plus U of U K minus one. So having done that, of course, then what you could do, you can write U K would be nothing but D inverse L into this plus D inverse U into this. And that's what we have written here. Uh, you can see there is a D inverse L part. So this bracket has not been closed. And there is a D inverse U part that is operating at the previous aspect level. And then we have side equal to B. So we just keep on adding that. So there uh, we may actually have uh, added here a B vector. So that's what we have here. B. And there, I will also have e vector. This sort of term, one minus theta operating on D and theta operating on U matrix, and that uh, the last one is that uh, additive path, the B vector. Okay, <clears throat> so right, I'm I'm relaxing. I'm not taking exactly the same value as the residue has been obtained. I I'm not. I have just added an additional degree of freedom. So I am relaxing. That, that comes from the previous equation that I wrote. Remember, and we have uh, not taken what we have here. We have an algorithm by which we predict. That is what is given in the second part. Right? So that part, I am not taking what it is calculated as it is. I am taking a fraction of it or little more of it. That is what this theta indicates. So, theta indicates whether I am taking what I have calculated the whole of it or a part of it or more of it. That is what this role of capital theta is. Then to that what I do is I already have some estimate of it in the previous level. So, I take the rest of it is this. It is your something like your liver rule. You may have done it in your mechanics course. Say, if I have one value here, another value here, about the fulcrum, I take a balanced quantity from both the sides, right? So that theta is basically tells you about this relative size of the distances from the fulcrum to the ends, right? So think of your L as the left-hand uh, point of the bar, and L plus one as the right, and the one that you are choosing by this method is where you are actually calculating the moment about the fulcrum. So this is exactly the same procedure. This always whenever you adopt some relaxation procedure, you take it in a manner that it has to be consistent. What, what is the consistency condition here? Consistency condition is the coefficient. See on the equation 56, what is the coefficient of u is 1, right? And on the right hand side, the coefficients are? 1 minus theta and theta. When I add it up, again it has to become 1. So I have no other choice. I cannot just simply take 1 minus theta and 2 theta. That will be inconsistent. Okay? So you understand that that is the consistency condition that you have invoked that you have taken a part of theta. If it is overestimated, then the other part has to be underestimated so that the two together would give you a quantum which is exactly what you want it to be. Of course, you can redefine a new variable. That is the easy part to do, right? So that is not uh, difficult. So having obtained uh, the equation that we have in the last part, so what I could do is I can multiply both sides by d plus theta l inverse, right? So that will give me the equation 58, right? 
So, that is what I, we have done, we have just simply taken D The way we define the gain matrix is nothing but the coefficient of u of k minus 1. That is what we are doing. See, I have u of k minus 1, I am multiplying by g to get the new iterate, and that is precisely what we have here. So, in uh, 58, uh, this uh, whole thing minus uh, k minus 1 constitutes your gain matrix. This we have done it. So, now what happens you can very clearly see how uh, theta comes into play because by a different value of uh, theta I could uh, alter the eigen spectrum of the G matrix, right. So, for this Gauss cycle method we can do that and we can obtain the gain matrix as given by 59 and then uh, we can fall back upon uh, this uh, theorem of Ostrowski and Varga and this also requires something out of the A matrix that you have. Uh, the conditionality being that A has to be symmetric okay. uh, and alpha is positive, I uh, just uh, forgot to write that and then what will happen uh, this uh, gain matrix which is now the function of the relaxation parameter theta. So, the gain matrix will have this Eigen spectrum, the maximum of which the spectral radius of that g of theta would be less than 1 if uh, this A matrix is positive definite and theta is bracketed between 0 and 2. So, this is uh, the driving observation that why capital theta has to be upper bounded up to 2. This comes from this theorem. Okay. <coughs> Now, of course, uh, once again you would find that uh, many a times uh, that this uh, expectations from the uh, property of A matrix are uh, not uh, obtained. So, we need to look for uh, other iterative methods. How we do that? We try to uh, calibrate uh, the iterative method by defining a quantifying parameter which here we are calling it as the efficiency of the iterative method. So, the efficiency of the iterative method depends upon the following two uh, sub clauses that how much of work that I have to do in each iteration that is what we are talking about work required for iteration uh, that has to be compounded with how many such iterations I will have to do that defines the total work right for overall convergence and this two together should be minimum that that is precisely what we are aiming at. Uh, to understand uh, how to calculate this uh, it will be a little beyond the scope of this, but it is shown that if I keep on doing this iteration uh, over many many steps then we can find out the error norm at k plus 1 at stage uh, when divided by the error at the kth stage almost uh, becomes given by the spectral radius, right. This uh, you have actually seen this equation in a somewhat different way when we did that. If you recall how the error at the kth stage was related to error at the initial condition, we found out that was related to lambda to the power m. So, that was there we had said that if it was a stationary linear iteration, we had the same set of lambda. and but what happens is if we adopt now the point of view that the G matrices are going to be different at different levels of iteration like what you are going to go and uh, give it to me even for the 3 by 3 system, then what you find that um, this um, spectrum of the G matrix will keep changing from iteration to iteration. But if you go over a large step, then you would find that it all balances out to the spectral radius of the equivalent linear uh, stationary linear iteration, right. So, basically then uh, you can see the importance of the spectral radius of this uh, matrix plays a role in deciding how error you are reducing per time step, right. 
that is if uh, lambda of g is less than 1, then if I take a logarithm of that quantity, that will tell you how many decimal places that uh, we have shifted the error to. Okay? <coughs> so, that is why we define this rate of convergence as minus of log uh, lambda to the base 10. So, minus is of course, there to give it a positive flavor, because you know, I mean if it is really convergent method, and uh, lambda will be less than 1, and log of that will be minus. So, that is uh, what overall you get a positive quantity, right. Now, uh, this was the kind of scenario that people were looking at for a long, long time. Then uh, came uh, this uh, new method, uh, which is called the alternative direction implicit method, okay, ADI method. This was uh, for uh, some of you who are from chemical engineering would be happy to note that this was done by some people working in chemical engineering. It came out in uh, uh, mid 50s to late 50s. Eastman, Ratchford, Douglas, they, they are the major uh, uh, people developing this method. See what uh, really happened. Now, if you look at it uh, in a take a historic perspective, first we add this point method, right. In the point method also, we could take a Jacobi method or we could take a gauss seidel method, right. We have seen that. Then we have seen that we could also solve it line by line, right. Then we had those line method. Then we had this relaxation method. So, the subject is progressing. So, we have gone from point to line and then from point to line to relaxation methods. And then, uh, this idea occurred to some people, like boundary value problem. So, all the boundary be incorporated as quickly as possible. See what is happening here. Here the boundary condition is slowly percolating as I am going up. Hmm? Suppose, I do it like this that in one stroke, I go from bottom to top and in the next stroke, I go from left to right. Then what happens? When I am going from this way to that way, I am bringing in this um, at one go, this is being felt only when I almost come there, right. Now, if I take the sweep from left to right, this two boundary condition and this boundary condition would come to play right at the onset itself. So, in this alternative uh, direction implicit method, ADI method, the name itself suggests that we will switch directions alternately. So, once I will go from let us say bottom to top, next I will go from uh, left to right and this is uh, what is the basic idea. Now, let us uh, try to explain it in terms of a uh, equation elliptic PD as given by this equation 60 and this is uh, what is called as the elliptic PD in a self adjoint form. So, basically uh, self adjoint form comes the way this A and C matrices of uh, sorry A and C appears in this equation. Okay. So, that you can uh, discretize these terms in a manner, so that the resultant matrix you can invoke symmetry of that matrix. Uh, so, the role of self adjoint form in solving elliptic PD is quite central and we will start from here in the next slide.